There's a peace on the island that you don't find on Shoa. There are hundreds of boats going in and out of the harbor in summer, and it's part of my happiness to know that they're dependent on my beacon to guide them safely. The lamp has to be lit exactly at sundown. My bed on the second floor is angled so I can see the light at all times. At night, I awaken every half hour to be certain that the light is burning proper, the chimney is clear, and there's enough oil in the fountain. The light is my child. I know when it needs me, even if I sleep. Ida Lewis is not only the most famous woman lighthouse keeper who ever lived, she's probably the most famous lighthouse keeper who ever lived. She was a celebrity, a heroine of mythic proportions in her own time, yet we had sort of forgotten about her. Well, I think Ida Lewis uh, deserves a place in our national memory forever. I mean, she was, she was one of the most famous American women of the 19th century, probably the most famous woman ever from Newport. You couldn't make up a, a better story. You know, if you made up a, a, a historical personage in a, in a novel, you couldn't come up with something more dramatic and, and more compelling than Ida Lewis. My name is Ida, Ida Lewis. Please excuse my appearance. I was just trying to get a little washing done when this young man comes running up to my door calling, quick, Ida, quick, hurry, come quick. Well, I thought maybe somebody was drowning. Then he explained to me as he rode me to show from Lime Rock in, in Newport Harbor that he was taking me to visit with all those people because they wanted to hear stories about the rescues in the harbor. Well, before I talk about some of the rescues, I'd like to tell you how it was we come to live on Lime Rock. The Half Acre Rock, as Admiral Dewey once called it, Well, I was 12 years old in 1854 when my father, Hosea Lewis, captain of a revenue cutter for as long as I could remember, had to retire because of decline in health. Our mother, Ida Wally Zoradia Lewis, had borne five children. I was named for her, for my mother, Ida Wally Zoradia Lewis. They took to calling me Ida. We lived in Newport in a comfortable house on the corner of Spring and Brewer, where all of the children were born. Father's duties were to row out to the rock, which is about half a mile from town, and then to fill, set, and extinguish the light, to fill and set it in the evening, and then in the morning to row back out again and extinguish it. Ida's father was Hosea Lewis, and he was a mariner by trade. He also was a pilot, a cutter pilot. The cutter service was actually established by the federal government to go up and down the coastline to make sure that piracy uh, wasn't a problem, because actually it was at the time. You have to remember that all of these ports were very active commercial ports. And so he was part of that service. That service actually later on became the U.S. Coast Guard. But at the time, it was a federal agency, not a military one. And so he was very well versed in the sea. He did that for 12 years, but he had failing health. I went along with him. He taught me how to take care of the light and he taught me how to row. I taught myself how to swim. Nobody else in the family knew how. Without even realizing it, my arms were getting real strong. Father even told me how to rescue a drowning man. Always bring him in over the stern, he'd say. But it was difficult in hard weather, getting out twice a day to Lime Rock. So, Father asked the lighthouse board to build us a house there on the rock, right in the middle of Newport Harbor. Even though it was only about 220 yards from the shore, the weather at the time was particularly fierce. And for someone of ill health, it must have been very grueling. So the government granted that, a house was built, and so he moved everyone onto the island in 1857. It seemed like everything was going just fine. Father's salary was increased to $560 a year. But 
Four months after the family moved to Lime Rock, father took a paralyzing shock. When he recovered, he was unable to work, so mother and I took over. I was 15 at the time. I'm sure other family members helped, but uh, really right from that time when her father became incapacitated, Ida took over the duties of uh, keeping the light for the most part. Uh, and she, it just seemed like she was born to do that. Uh, she was, by the time she was 14, they said she was the best swimmer in Newport. She was renowned as uh, one of the best rowers around. And uh, phys she was physically very capable of handling the, the job and just uh, her personality seemed very suited to it. My brother Rudd liked to tell folks, Ida, she knows how to handle a boat. She can hold one to win it in a gale better than any man I ever saw wet and oar, and do it too when the sea is breaking over her. Rowing the boat seemed come natural to me. I carried Rudd and Hosey and Hattie when she was strong enough to go to and from Jones Wharf so they could go to school. I fetched supplies and food out to the rock. Whenever there was a storm, I was up to my knees in water. She would row her younger siblings ashore to go to school in all kinds of weather. Her father uh, was quoted as saying he, he would be absolutely scared to death. He couldn't look. Sometimes he'd see her trying to come back to the, the, uh, the island in this terrible weather in the winter, whatever, with heavy seas. And he was afraid she wouldn't make it. He couldn't. He had to turn his head. He just couldn't look. But she always made it, and he was always happy to see her. This rock is called Lime Rock because of the composition of the rock. This is white rock that the lighthouse sits on, and it's the only rocks like this in all of Newport. When, when Ida lived here, the, this island was probably 400 feet across, uh, or 400 feet in diameter. And it's not large at all, it's, it's a rock, and there's an adjoining rock that uh, is uh, quite a bit smaller. Newport was, a, was a, a major seaport, and in fact, in the 18th century, was one of the bigger cities in the country. This harbor was full of coasting schooners and, and larger, larger vessels at the, at the time. The, uh, the, the time that she spent here was before yachting activity really started in the United States. I think there was something about just the environment of Lime Rock, living in this very isolated little island in the harbor, in a sense that gave Ida the opportunity to be who she was. Uh, she was certainly living a life that was very different from the norm of women in the uh, late 19th, 19th century. It was just a natural progression that Ida would have just stepped up to the plate. She already had been accompanying her dad back and forth to the light. She was fascinated with it. She loved it. She loved the lighthouse. This became abundantly clear throughout her life. She never wanted to leave. That life was not for everybody, and lighthouse keeping wasn't as romantic as people tend to think. Uh, but uh, Ida seemed uh, perfectly content and happy at Lime Rock. Uh, so that's, uh, again, part of her character. It was a peaceful place. Of course, there are times in the winter when the storms are so fierce, the spray dashes against the window so thick you can't see out. And for days at a time, no boat would dare come near the rock, not even if we were starving. But I'm happy. In inclement weather, uh, a person might be stuck here for days at a time without being able to go ashore. And in the winter, when it froze over and became icy, you were stuck here because it, it, the ice extended out far enough you couldn't row through the ice, and yet the ice was so thin you couldn't walk on it. So you were more or less stuck here for periods of maybe a week or two or maybe even three. It had to be terrifying to be at a place like Lime Rock during a major storm, especially in the, the winter with the sleet or snow just and rain beating against those windows and uh, the place probably shaking in the wind. It had to be terrifying. Uh, I mean, there were lighthouses that were swept away in storms. Underneath me is a cistern where the, uh, the roof gutters led in, into a big tank that's down uh, below this room, the big brick tank. So they had to have all their water here and of course all their own food and uh, wood or coal for the, the stove. That was before there was electricity. Uh, people had to be totally self-sufficient. You had to provide your own heat, your own light, and your own water. 
well, the stove was was here, and this was the center of activity in the wintertime because it was the only warm room in, in the entire lighthouse. Everything else was cold, most likely. And I would say that the the bedrooms were probably 30 degrees or 35 degrees, and to uh, go to bed at night, you would put bricks or uh, large stones in the oven of, of the uh, stove and warm them up and then take them up and put them in your bed to warm your bed before you got into bed. One of the things that was so appealing about Ida was her resourcefulness and uh, sort of this stubborn Yankee stock. When people ask me about the dangers, I just tell them, we only have one life to live. When the time comes, we got to go. So it doesn't matter how. Ida's first rescue had to do with actually boys that were her age. She rescued 16-year-olds, and Ida was 16 at the time. This was 1858. And these boys were out on just a pleasure ride, a little cat boat. They were sailing about the harbor, and they went out to have lunch on this thing called the dumplings, which was this outcropping of rocks. And they were kind of messing around on the boat. The waves had picked up. One of the young men climbed the mast and began rocking the boat back and forth. Suddenly, the boat capsized, tossing all four boys into the chilly water. They tried to hang on to the slippery hull, but their weight slowly submerged it. I ran to my skiff and slid it into the water. When I got to them, I had to keep away from their grabbing hands lest they turn my boat over. I did manage to get them in one by one. Father had been watching from the house through the telescope and collapsed with relief when the last one was safe aboard. I finally got him back to the house. One boy was almost gone. Mother had to revive him with stimulants, <clears throat> a, a teaspoon of brandy. The interesting thing about this rescue was that no one knew about it. The boys clearly didn't tell their parents, and they were from, you know, good Newport stock. And later on, the anecdote to this story is that uh, one of these fellows actually outlived Ida and was one of her pallbearers. The next rescue I don't take pleasure in remembering at all. It was in February of 1866. I just turned 24. Three drunk soldiers were returning from Newport to Fort Adams, and they thought they would hasten their return by stealing a skiff from Jones Bridge instead of walking the distance to the fort. It so happened that the skiff they stole belonged to my brother Rudd. Most of the rescues she made were people who were in smaller boats that were traveling between Fort Adams and Newport or were sailing in Newport Harbor or rowing in Newport Harbor. As soon as they were out a little ways, one of them in a drunken frenzy kicked his boot through the bottom of the boat, which immediately filled up with water. Two of the men swam away the third one, the kicker, hung on to the wreck and was being carried by a strong tide toward the bay. It seems as though a lot of these mishaps were alcohol related, yes, and a lot of them involved uh, soldiers from Fort Adams that were, that were uh, transiting back and forth between Newport and Fort Adams by rowboat. When I reached him, I tried hauling him over the stern. He was very intoxicated. He was very large and quite unable to help himself at all. In trying to pull him over the stern, I strained my back, which took some time to heal after that. Finally, I lashed him to the boat and towed him to the rock. After loaning him dry clothes, I rowed him to shore and never saw him again. I think one of Ida's greatest strengths uh, from everything, from her own descriptions of her rescues and everything was her ability to stay calm in those situations. Uh, from all accounts, she never feared for her own safety. She risked her own life, but she thought nothing of doing that. She always felt she did what she had to do. She, she would say, well, wouldn't you do the same thing? Which of course, most people wouldn't, but, but she was kind of matter of fact about it. and. Sometimes she had to, the rescues didn't happen easily. Ida was not a, not a, a, a big woman. She was certainly strong and fit uh, and, uh, you know, able to do a lot of things, but she was probably only something like maybe five, two or three uh, and uh, 103 pounds, I believe. So she was not a, not a big woman. It's just phenomenal that she was able to, to perform these rescues that she did. She was very somber in her looks. She was quiet. 
unassuming, very humble, and that came through in the way that she looked. She had hazel eyes, she had brown hair. Throughout her life, she wore her hair pinned up and back. The skirt of her dress would be probably about 10 to 12 yards of fabric. In the wintertime, we're talking wool. And so wool is extremely heavy, as everyone knows. She had to wear button-up shoes, little boots, with a small heel. So if you just put all of those together and you think of her actually out trying to physically rescue someone, that it's amazing that she could actually do this. The strangest rescue happened the following January, having to do with three farmhands and a sheep. The three Irish farmhands were running Mr. Belmont's prime sheep through the town when suddenly the sheep took a notion to run down the old mill wharf. It plunged headlong into the tide. August Belmont, as many may know, uh, he's the one that actually founded the Belmont Stakes, and he was a very wealthy financier from Wall Street who summered uh, in Newport. And of course, as many people did at the time, they had livestock. This was not uncommon, and uh, much of Newport was farmland. The Irish farmers ran round by the road to Jones Wharf, where Rudd's new skiff was tied. They climbed in, let loose, and shoved off. But, never having rowed before, they were soon swamped by their own weight and the gale-driven waves. They were hanging onto the skiff and drifting seaward when I caught sight of them from the kitchen window. I was right away to the boat. I could hear them yelling. When I reached them, their faces were filled with terror of the poor souls. The sunken boat was slipping away from their numb fingers. I got him into the skiff and pulled him hard back to shore, landing him safe. But as to the sheep, I could see it swimming for dear life trying to get back. So I put in again and finally reached the beast. With great difficulty, I got a rope around his neck and towed it back to the farmers. I do not think they reported the story of the sodden sheep to its owner or anyone else. But to this day, whenever I happen on any of the three Irish in town, they shake my hand heartily and give me many grateful God blessings. Up until 1869, hardly anyone knew about the rescues, and that was fine by me. But on March 29th, things changed. I was then 27 years old. It was about 5 o'clock in the evening. I was sick with a bad cold, sitting by the stove men in one of the cotton cloths I used to polish the lantern. I asked Mother to check the light tower to see if the wick needed any attention. I heard her suddenly come running down the stairs. Ida! Oh, my God! Ida, run quick! A boat's capsized and men are drowning. Run quick, Ida! My invalid father tried to stop me. The waves and the wind were fierce. Mother stood outside on the rocks, calling and waving her arms, trying to attract the men's attention to our boat on the way to give them heart to help them hold on longer. I was rowing hard. My arms were cramping. When we finally got to him with a well-timed stroke, I turned the boat so the men could be hauled in over the stern. The soldier said later that in a sudden burst of wind, the boy inadvertently jammed the tiller in the wrong direction and the waves rolled the boat over twice. They all tried holding on to the keel, but the boy's strength gave out, and he finally let go and went under. I finally managed to row us back to the rock against a very strong southeaster. One soldier 
Sergeant James Adams could barely stumble up to the house. The other, Private John McLaughlin, was unconscious from exposure. Hosey and I struggled to carry the private up over the rocks and inside. Mother wrapped us all in blankets as close to the stove as possible. She made a brew of hot molasses for us all and one with a teaspoon of brandy for the private. He finally came round. We keep a small bottle in the back of the cupboard for just such emergencies. The two soldiers stayed the night, and the next morning, when he was recovered, Sergeant Adams confessed that when he first saw my boat approaching and a woman rowing, he was thinking, She's only a woman. She'll never reach us. But, he said, I soon changed my mind. This was her first documented rescue that actually brought her global attention. And the reason for it, I believe, and there's a lot of conjecture out there about this, was that it involved military. And so it had to be reported. When the two soldiers got back to the fort, the story was out. A reporter from the New York Tribune heard about the rescues, and soon the whole country was talking about it. And her life changed literally overnight because of that. It just was a matter of weeks before Harper's Weekly and Leslie's Illustrated, which were tabloids at the time, weekly periodicals that were well-read, almost like magazines, uh, they sent reporters out and sketchers, you know, illustrators, to come out and to document Ida's actual everyday life. Then there was an article in Harper's Weekly that wondered whether it was womanly to row a boat and pull a half-drowned man into a skiff. Some of the uh, publications of the day, like Harper's Weekly, even though they proclaimed Ida as the bravest woman in America, they still felt that there was something almost unfeminine about rowing boats and doing the kind of work that she did. At the end of the article it said, only a donkey would think it unfeminine to be saving lives. Then, whoever wrote the article said he surely hoped Ida Lewis would soon be safely married. That article actually was the article that dubbed her the Grace Darling of America. Grace Darling was the daughter of an English lighthouse keeper, and uh, before Ida came to prominence, Grace was probably the most famous lighthouse woman in the world. But that was pretty much almost entirely because of one particular rescue, where she and her father rescued uh, some sailors from a shipwreck a very dramatic rescue and it made worldwide headlines. She was 23 at the time. When Ida conducted her rescue, she was 27. And by the time she was uh, actually Grace Darling's age, she had already conducted four rescues that the world didn't know about yet. And that really carried through her entire life because as we know from accounts, when she passed away, she had a photograph, a drawing of Grace Darling's grave, her cemetery plot that was right above her bed. And so she really felt that there was some kinship there. Then came all the celebrating and the presents. Sergeant Adams and Private McLaughlin gave me a gold watch and a gold chain. All the soldiers at Fort Adams put their monies together and gave me $218. And on July 4th, the people of Newport gave me a new boat called the Rescue. It was fancy. For that year's 4th of July, the citizens of Newport decided that uh, it, was, it wasn't just Independence Day, uh, they decided to call it Ida Lewis Day. 4,000 people were said to turn out, according to newspaper accounts. They actually greeted her on the shore. There was an enormous parade. Everyone had Ida Lewis badges, there were banners, they were wearing their scarves in the fichu style, which is how she wore it. There were picnics, and they had all of these speeches set up just to talk about Ida Lewis and, and her bravery and her great feats. They presented Ida with uh, a new rowboat, the Rescue, which uh, was an incredibly beautiful boat with uh, mahogany rails and velvet seat cushions and had actual gold had gilding on it. They brought it to the edge of the water, right near Lime Rock, put it in the water, and asked Ida to get in. When the fussing was over, I climbed into my new boat, all decorated with flags, and set out for the lighthouse. It was a very nice boat, but I do prefer my handy old skiff. As I rowed away, 
Everybody waved. It was also at that time where Newport realized this is somebody important. And after that, actually, the local newspapers covered her continually, along with all the publicity. Ida also got some interesting offers. She was asked to basically go on the road with a vaudevillian act, and they were going to pay her $1,700 right up front. That's a lot of money. That's three times more than her father was making, if not four, in his heyday. They also wrote songs about her. There was a waltz and a mazurka. They've asked her to go public speaking tour. She said no to all of this. She just wanted to do her job. She wanted to stay on Lime Rock. A lot of people started to visit the rock that summer. Father was counting a hundred people a day. They'd all be saying how brave I was. I'd tell him anybody would rescue a drowning man. I just happened to see him first. Yes, Ida Lewis was the most celebrated uh, lighthouse keeper in uh, the United States. And in fact, um, Lime Rock Light became somewhat of a tourist attraction. And uh, there are accounts that say that during the course of a summer, nine or 10,000 people would come to visit Ida Lewis uh, out here and it, because of, of the curiosity factor and, and the fact that this heroine was, was living out here and, and, and they wanted to see what she did and how she lived her life. And, and she was inundated with uh, visitors. I know there are some uh, exaggerated illustrations over the years. One was uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not actually did a little feature on, on Ida and showed her as kind of a, a superwoman uh, clinging to a rock and uh, in, the, in the, this very dramatic pose. Admiral George Dewey visited the island that summer. He always dressed elegant. First time he came to Lime Rock, he said, Ms. Lewis, I want to smoke on your half-acre rock for a half hour. <laughs> I sure did like him. I named my dog after him, <laughs> Dewey. She also had every Astor, every Vanderbilt, every elite captain of industry's wife who vacationed there found her fascinating. They'd come out to visit her as well. Elsie Vanderbilt, who married into the family, became a very special friend. She visited often. We had good conversations about all sorts of things. I think Ida Lewis was sort of part of the Society of Newport, but sort of apart for, from it. Uh, they would visit her, and I think they would have tea parties sometimes with her at the, at the lighthouse. I doubt that she ever visited them at their mansions. Uh, I doubt that very much. Uh, I don't think she would have been comfortable doing that. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony visited the island that September. They were having a big meeting in Newport and they wanted me to join their cause. Well, I spent most of the afternoon listening to Miss Anthony. She did go on. She's very strong in her speaking. When they finally left in their sailboat, I decided I would rather conduct another rescue than another visit with Miss Susan B. Anthony and her companions. They left thinking, this is a woman that actually really personifies what it is we're talking about, a woman doing a man's job and doing it well. Ida was not comfortable with being a, a symbol of, of women's rights at all. I think she was a very humble person, which is typical. The other women keepers of that time were very, very similar. General William Tecumseh Sherman, who served under General Grant during the war, visited once after the war. Oh, he seemed so tired. He was kind of a nervous man. When he arrived, he sat on the rock for nearly an hour, asking me questions about my life and saying he was glad to get to such a peaceful place. She was a darling of Civil War heroes. They, they just flocked to her. The other was a visit from the president, Ulysses S. Grant, who was in Newport, about to board a train for Boston. He had his carriage pull up on Long Wharf so I could row over and meet him and his wife and his son and daughter there. It was a special time to me, a 27-year-old woman, and he wanted to greet me. 
She also received hundreds of proposals of marriage, which is amazing because people didn't know her. And she actually had a father actually come to the island and say, my son would like to marry you. He's at West Point. Here's his photograph. And here's a letter of recommendation from our U.S. Senator about his character. And she just didn't know what to do. She was flabbergasted. So she just told him, I'm engaged. He's too young. Thanks for coming. Ida did marry, and actually she was engaged during the time that she became famous. She was uh, in her late 20s when she married a man named William Wilson. He was a for-hire captain, and he was actually based in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, Black Rock Harbor, which was another huge uh, commercial harbor at the time. When you married back then, you moved in with your husband, clearly. And she left. She went to Bridgeport, and she lived there for less than two years. It must have been just uh, so stressful for Ida and such basically a, a shock to her, her psyche when she, she married. And after, after being a lighthouse keeper for 12, 13 years by that time, to have to move to a totally new place. She had never been outside of Newport before. Uh, and to suddenly fulfill that traditional role of a, a wife in the 19th century to her, to her husband after pretty much running the show at, at uh, Lime Rock. She came back upon her father's demise. Hosea died two years later in 1872. So she landed back at Lime Rock. She would never speak of the marriage, yet she never divorced. He never came on the scene again, never claimed any of her notoriety. And interestingly enough, when she had been asked about changing her name to Wilson, she did change it initially, but then she went back to Lewis when she moved back. And that was something that she said on the record she would never do. She'd rather be a Mrs. Somebody than Ida Lewis. So it's an interesting story because she even reversed herself, which kind of leads us to believe that later on in life, she would have more independence about her identity. In her years at Lime Rock, Ida was credited officially with 18 lives saved. I think it was actually quite a bit more than that, probably 30 or 35 or something like that. Probably the majority of them were actually of soldiers from Fort Adams. And while there's no official record of this or anything, I'm sure that at least in some of the cases they had been imbibing probably more than they should have. Clearly her most daring rescue of all was in uh, February of 1881. Uh, this was a very cold winter, even by Newport standards, and as was the tendency in the dead of winter, the harbor used to freeze over. So two soldiers, after they'd had a nice time at the grog shops, decided that they wanted to just take the shortcut across the bay, and they were going to walk. They'd been walking on the thin ice and had fallen through. Again, it was Ida's mother who spotted them, and she started screaming. Ida was ill, and she was sitting by the fire. She actually had her shoes off. She ran out of the door. She grabbed a clothesline. I called to her brother, please come. You have to help me. As Ida was running out the door with the clothesline around her neck, her mother passed out. She fainted. And uh, the two men were just uh, panicking. We're trying to, gr she got a clothesline to them, but they both were trying to grab onto the line at once and she had to tell them one at a time. Well, under the weight of that, the ice collapsed underneath her. She went in. And you have to remember, she's wearing skirts that are at least 10 yards. They're now soaking wet. The whole thing must have been incredibly shocking for her. She probably was getting hypothermia. The two soldiers are screaming and yelling. She has the clothesline wrapped around her so she can't get away from them. Somehow she manages to get back up on the solid ice and she sort of inches her way. And then she got some control of the situation. She calmed down those two men and one let go of the rope. She was able to pull the first one out. By this point, her brother had arrived. Together, they got the second one out. Uh, I just absolutely can't imagine uh, staying as calm as she did and, and, and following through on that rescue. I think, I don't think there are many people who would be capable of, of performing that rescue. In fact, when uh, Ida was uh, presented with a gold life-saving medal by Congress for that rescue in 1881, she was the first woman to receive a gold life-saving medal. And it really is the equivalent of the Congressional Medal of Honor that you would get if you were in the military, except it's for civilians. And it's a real insight into Ida's physical strength. Besides taking care of the light, what means the most to me is receiving the official appointment of Keeper of the Lime Rock Light. You see, when appointed keepers die or become disabled like my father did, Wives and daughters often took over, but they never received 
the official appointment. They just assume the duties. So roughly, you're talking having that position unofficially anywhere from 10 to 25 years without ever being appointed and just basically accepting the pension or the money for your father's position, but never actually having the title. In 1877, however, shortly after I rescued three musicians from drowning in the harbor, General Ambrose Burnside, governor of Rhode Island after the war, a senator in Washington, he found out about the rescues and about my having no appointment. He put a lot of pressure to bear on his friends in the Naval Academy, and he also made a big stink about it with the, with the press, saying this woman deserves this, she doesn't have it, and I think it's about time. So in 1879, Ida was officially appointed the Lighthouse Keeper of Lime Rock. I was very grateful. For me, it was not only an honor, but a right. And I received a salary of $750 a year and two ton of coal. I suppose Miss Anthony would be proud. Ida's last official documented rescue was, uh, had to do with two friends of hers, actually. Uh, these two women were coming out to see her. It was 1906. Ida was 63 years old. And they stood up in the boat. One had to fix, uh, I guess, the skirts uh, of her dress, and they toppled over. Ida got in her skiff and zipped out and rescued them and, and pulled them back into her boat. I always believe that Ida got all the health in the family because as you read through the chronicles of her family, they were just always sick. And they actually, all of them died young except for her brother, Rudolph, who did outlive her. All this happened within the span of 10 years, between 1872 and 1882. Her mom passed away at the age of 72. But this left Ida alone at the lighthouse. Her brother, Rude, was around part of the time, but he was also a seafaring man, and he was a mariner by trade, so he'd go out a lot on long missions and, and for long cruises, and she was there pretty much alone all the time, which she loved because, as she said time and again, the light is my child, and if I'm no longer needed here, I hope to die. And that actually is what happened. She spent her entire life here, except for, for two years, and actually died in, in, in this room, in, in the spot where I'm sitting now, and had had a, a stroke. It was the morning of October 21st, 1911. I'd had gone out, as was her cause, to pick up some wood and to start the hearth, and she collapsed. Her brother, Rudolph, uh, found her, uh, apparently on the floor by the fireplace, and she was still conscious at that point. She said, uh, asked him to get the doctor. And so he did. He left the island and did not want to leave, but he did. When he came back with the doctor in the boat, she was, she was unconscious and she would never wake again. They were able to move her upstairs and, and she lived for a couple of days more. She was in a coma for about four days, from the 21st to the 24th. During that time, there were some visitors, they were selective, of course, and they would just sit with her. The word got out that she had fallen ill, stricken, I believe, was in the headline, and the telegrams poured in, as well as flowers and well-wishers. It made national news. There were reports, uh, Ida, Ida Lewis's uh, health failing. That was big news around the country. One of the visitors was Elsie Vanderbilt. When she heard of Ida's illness, she wanted to be by her side and just to say goodbye. And she came and spent the afternoon of the 23rd with her. Ida died shortly before 8 a.m. on the morning of October 24th. And they put her in a casket and then they rowed her to the mainland. She was then laid in state for several hours from 10 to 2, which is very unusual for anyone who was a working class citizen. And over 1,500 people passed by her coffin. The bells of all the vessels in Newport tolled that night. During the funeral procession itself, shops had closed in honor of her, and uh, all the flags were flown at half staff on the public buildings. Again, this is not what's done for civilians. The Thames Methodist Church was packed to the hilt, and the crowd spilled out in 100 yards on either direction. There were numerous dignitaries, of course, at her funeral. Uh, they, they came a long distance to just pay respects. Her pallbearers were rightly so, some of the soldiers from Fort Adams, as well as the fellow that she rescued when he was a young lad at the age of 16. It was a huge event. It was almost as if a, a president or some, some you know, important national figure had died. And she was an important national figure. 
that his brother Rudolph was actually quite vocal with the local newspapers uh, as to why his sister died. He believed, and he put actually squarely on the Lighthouse Bureau's doorstep, the bureaucracy, the red tape, the chiding, uh, the lack of uh, respect that he believed she got led to a lot of stress, he believed. And he said that this was a girl, a woman that was not prone to moodiness. She was not depressed. Uh, she had a very good spirit, but yet she was very blue the last couple of months of her life. And he truly believes that's why she had the stroke at 69. The 1880s ushered in sort of a re the introduction of electricity and basically the restructuring of how lighthouses were run. And from the 1880s to the early 1900s, the Lighthouse Bureau was going to systematically change over all of the navigational aids, including Ida's. Ida, at this point, was getting older, and it was very paperwork intensive. Everything had to be done in triplicate. You had to be very careful of your inventory and your supplies. They added new layers of management. Much younger people were brought in, civilian workers, who didn't know anything about the sea, didn't know anything about lighthouses. They were just clerics. And she was actually reprimanded by a clerk in Washington who may or may not have been aware that she was considered a national heroine and was as famous as she was, but she was reprimanded for not properly filling out forms. There are missives going back and forth from the Lighthouse Bureau and her, basically chiding her for not knowing what she's doing. She was quite worried about this. She expressed uh, you know, fear that she could lose her job. And then on top of that, uh, in uh, not too long before she died, there was talk of actually doing away with Lime Rock Light. And that would have been the worst possible thing to happen to this woman. About uh, uh, a decade after she died, the Lighthouse Service renamed Lime Rock Light as uh, Ida Lewis Light. I don't believe that's, that's uh, happened before or since that any lighthouse was renamed for its famous keeper, so that's quite an honor. The light was closed in 1927 and became the Idolist Yacht Club in 1928. Today, the Idolist Yacht Club has 385 members and is an active participant in yachting events around Newport and Narragansett Bay and the East Coast. It's very important to keep the memory of Ida Lewis alive it reminds us of how our nation was built on maritime commerce, and lighthouse keepers made that possible by allowing safe navigation. But beyond that, Ida is just such a, a special story of, of heroism and, and bravery, and and um, and I think nobility and humbleness at the same time. Uh, I think everybody can learn from that. And the fact that she was a woman is extremely important. And uh, even today. I don't think things have changed to the point where a young girl can still learn from the example of Ida Lewis and uh, can feel that she's capable of anything by that example. It's possible that Ida's spirit is literally still at the Lime Rock Lighthouse, now the Ida Lewis Yacht Club. Uh, if it's not literally there, it's certainly figuratively there. I mean, Ida's spirit is, is uh, th I think, uh, there on the harbor all the time, and you feel it whether or not she's an actual ghost there. Her spirit is absolutely there. If Ida were here today, 100 years after her death, I think she'd be really proud that the record was set straight. With integrity, with honesty, the way she lived her life, now the world can reclaim her as the legend, as the heroine that she was, without the pomp, without the circumstance, without all the anecdotal stories. This is who Ida was, and quite frankly, I think she'd be smiling.